Good morning. Today we're going to talk about medical marijuana. How many of you, well, Ebony, I'll let you do the poll. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Here's our first poll this morning. So how many of you live in states where it is legal to smoke marijuana? And the second question, how many of you live in states where it is for medical use only? New York has just legalized it. They've got a lot of uh, stuff to get you know, together for it, but um, we're seeing a rise in the housing on you know, people coming out of the woodwork with marijuana. And we have to remind them that on the federal level, it's not legal. But we're really interested today in hearing what you've got to say about all of this and what the program's about here. And I thank you for the invite and hello everybody. I'm Rose Mitchell. Thank you. 75% say no, it's not legal in their state. And 75% also say it's for medical use only. Okay. I heard the lady said that she was from New York or that New York had just legalized it. They did on July. Um, and they um, have a carry three ounces of cannabis for recreational purposes only. Alabama just passed it. For medical use only. And Virginia, you know, we have the four states Alabama, Mississippi, Virginia, and Connecticut. And Virginia just passed it also. So, our next question How many of you have residents who have a medical marijuana license? That's the first question. And also, how many of you have had to evict residents for using marijuana on property? 67% say that they don't, but 33% say that they do have residents with medical marijuana license. And then um, most say they have not evicted for use of marijuana on property, which is interesting. Now, we're gonna stop our survey right there. We're gonna talk about marijuana. Those of you who've been in the business for since 2014, uh, which is almost close to too many years now, uh, like I have, know that the HUD does not allow marijuana on our properties, regardless to whether it's for medical or medicinal purposes. And the reason we took this subject today is because, as you know, or as you can see from the lady who says New York just passed it, Alabama just passed it, Virginia just passed it. Even though your residents may come to you with a medical card, they still cannot live on your property and participate in the smoking or marijuana. Because you know, not only do they smoke it now, they have the little candy, they have the edibles, they have the everything. But supposedly the edibles and the candy are not um, considered the same, but in HUD's eyes, I think it is going to be the same. The problem is trying to get around it. As we know, the smoking of it is what we smell, sense, what the neighbors complain about, or what gives them away. I was in the grocery store the other day, and the man, young man came in, and wow, he almost knocked me out. And I was thinking, we're in Alabama. It's supposed to be for medical reasons. Huh, I wonder if he has a medical card, things of that nature. We also got a email from a resident who was being evicted for marijuana being in her unit. The resident said that she did not have marijuana in her unit. She said that she had a hooker in her unit and that the manager saw the hooker pipe. And you have to for forgive me because all of this is really kind of new to me. I was called a hooker yesterday, but Ebony straight me and it's called a hooker pipe. Hooker. Well, my research and investigation on hooker pipes and they say that you can smoke different flavors of tobacco in hooker pipes. There are hooker bars, hooker lounges, 
they've got a whole new business on hookers, even though the state might not have passed a marijuana law because it's not evidence that it is marijuana. So when I called the manager, I asked her, did you see evidence of marijuana or did you just see tobacco? Because the resident says that she smokes tobacco in her hookah. And of course, the manager didn't go into touching or removing or gathering any evidence. So I just want to say that just because we see a pipe, a hookah pipe, then that doesn't necessarily mean that that resident is smoking marijuana in your property. You have to go a little further in terms of investigating to find out how, why, and what. So if it had been me, I would have asked the resident, I saw this pipe in your unit when I went up with maintenance. Maintenance called me and I went up and I saw this big pipe. And what are you smoking in it? It's always good to, to try to get them to confess first. And if she had told you tobacco, so that's interesting. Can I see the tobacco that you use, whatever have you? We do want to guard and we do want to follow the rules and regulations of her, but there's just a limit to what we can do without any concrete proof. So we have to have concrete proof. Uh, Ebony had put up on the screen the last time HUD had mentioned marijuana, and it came out in 2014. There was a HUD notice memorandum in 2014 that says that regardless, you cannot have marijuana on the property. We're still holding tight to that. But the administration that we have, the previous administration and the current administration, are thinking about uh, reducing the sentence for possession of marijuana. More states are passing state laws on marijuana, but HUD still hasn't done anything. Now, if the administration of the federal government under the president says that it's going to be legal, period, then I'm sure that HUD will take another stance on it but we have to wait on them to see. So I need feedback from you guys. Have you been having any problems? What about a neighbor complaining about the smell? Have you had any of that? And you know what I find curious, especially for those of you who have elderly properties or 202 properties, the residents that are now 62 and above, grew up in the Vietnam area, era. Now, so my research says, this is when marijuana became, uh, what did I want to say? When marijuana became really user-friendly in the US. It's when the vets came back from Vietnam because it was plentiful over there and a lot of them smoked it. So. In our elderly properties, we're having the same kind of conflict. Don't just think it involves family properties because it doesn't. Um, our 62 year olds were back during the Vietnam era. They might have been in college or just socially smoking. So we have had calls from elderly residents that live in 202 properties and high rises. And you know, in the high rises, you usually have a central ventilation system. Mm -hmm. The heat and your air come from a central system. And we had one little lady that said that somebody's smoking that stuff around you and it's coming into my apartment. They refer to it as that stuff. So just be aware that it not only affects family properties, but it could just as well affect an elderly property. So our poll evidence says what? How many have had residents complain about the smell of marijuana smoke? 90% say yes. And the second question says, how many have had residents complain about it, but you couldn't pinpoint exactly who was using it? And 90% say yes. And this reminds me of when I was a resident assistant in college. We'd have to go on rounds and I lived in a high rise. And on our rounds, we would always smell that that smell 
And so we would end up, because we had to confront whoever it was, we would end up going and sticking our noses in the door. Now, it was always very confrontational when you finally found which room it was coming from because they could get kicked out of the dorms for that. So, Miss Vicki, I guess the question is, when you do confront them, if you actually find the source of the smell, how do you handle it? Well, they should have a policy. It should be in the house rules. You should have, uh, management should have addressed marijuana smoking in their house rules. Now, I have read some house rules where it was in there and it is an offense along with a drug offense. They treat it that way and they give notice to evict. I have known one company, they couldn't really pinpoint it, pinpoint it, but they pretty much thought that it came from this particular unit. And the resident says that they had a friend that came in with the odor only. Now I'm not really an expert on this, so I don't know how long the odor stays in your clothes or in your car, but I know that it does. So they gave a lease violation but it's going to be up to what your rules say. For the most part, HUD has a no tolerance policy about it, but some of the management companies um, will give them a lease violation and perhaps a second chance. I have talked to physicians. I have uh, friends who are uh, doctors that have prescribed it for medical marijuana. I called, uh, prescribed medical marijuana. I called one on last week when I was trying to do my research for today. And I asked him, what makes a physician prescribe marijuana? And he says, well, because there are all kinds of cases. I have patients who have no appetite and it gives them an appetite. I have patients who are, um, have other issues and they're not getting the nutrients that they need. And so mainly it's pain, he said, an appetite enhancer and a uh, kind of like a stress reliever. Um, I told him when he told me that, I said, that's interesting. Um, the, the myth is that marijuana leads to stronger drugs. Have you all heard that myth? That's what my mama told me when I was growing up. If you smoke that stuff, you'll be on something else. Don't smoke that stuff. You know? Yeah, they call it a gateway drug. I'm sorry? They call it a gateway drug. Okay. So we were always afraid that if we mess with it, you know, we were going to be on cocaine or heroin and we're going to be strung out, that kind of thing. Kids don't have that same fear anymore. It's been proven that it doesn't do all of that to you. But think of it as a medical reason. I do know of people who of a gentleman that's 42 years old. He's six foot two and he weighs 60 pounds. That's very, very thin for a six two man. Uh, he does have medical issues and he, he has no appetite, he says. He always complains that he has no appetite. So his wife, they gave him a prescription for something that was similar to marijuana, but I guess it didn't have the right oil in it or the substance. And so when they went to the doctor to fill this prescription, she said the prescription was $500 for a month supply. That's a lot of money. And it's not covered by your insurance. So she asked the uh, pharmacist, well, do you have a generic drug? What can I use as a generic drug? She said, and the pharmacist told her marijuana. So her husband went to his doctor, told his doctor about the cost, how they could not afford it, and they gave him a prescription. So he does have, quote, unquote, a marijuana card. Now, are there people who abuse this? Yes. Are there doctors who write an excuse for it? everything, you know, they write a prescription for everything. Yes, they are. We found that out in our reasonable accommodations, though. So 
even though you might have, I'm back to that, even though you might have a resident that has a need and you can see the need, they tell you of their need or they have a medical card, it's still illegal on the HUD assisted property. Hey, Becky. Yes. Amanda had a comment. All right, so she says, I have a resident complaining about their neighbor he said the smell is coming into his unit and it is affecting him. He said he is getting high from his neighbor smoking in his unit, but he has no concrete proof and he's very upset that he feels we just don't want to do anything about it. The resident wanted to lie to the other resident and wanted me to search her unit almost like I should be a DEA unit. Police have come also numerous times and they say they never smell anything. Okay, Amanda, um, is this an elderly property? No. Okay. Well, as far as I know, there's really nothing you can do if the police have, have come and they have found no evidence, then um, the only other thing I can think of is just tell the, the officer that you can't, I mean, the resident that you can't be a uh, DA officer, and that you call the local police and they have not found anything. Now, the resident might ask you for a unit transfer. Would I turn a unit for that reason? I don't really think so. But there again, if the resident goes to his doctor and he tells his doctor that it's affecting him and he's getting high and he's getting antsy or he has anxiety from the odor, then maybe you want to reassess it. I'm assuming, Amanda, that you have gone in his unit, though, in the complaint first unit, and you have not smelled anything either, like the, the police haven't. So it might just be one of those things that um, residents get into, you know, how they go back and forth. It might be one of those things. But the only thing that I can tell you is if you had the police and the police have been in his unit, they have no reason to go into the other gentleman's unit unless they're standing there and they can smell it and vice versa. If you have had maintenance or pest control to go into the unit and they don't complain of an odor, then it's just one of those things. And you just have to deal with that complaining resident and tell him that there's nothing that you can do about it. So Ms. Vicki, she says that she did, she has been in the unit and she told the neighbor to call her when he smells it and he's never called. So she's tried. I saw something else that popped up about a smell so strong. It yes, popped. L. Mill says the smell is so strong, it seems everywhere you go, you smell it. And it seems like people just don't care anymore. They don't. Because it's, there's no stigma attached to it really anymore. Well, the people like the young man that came into the grocery store, you can tell obviously they don't. Um, you can pull up at a service station and get out and pump gas. I did that over the weekend. And it just kind of blows you away. Yeah. Um, it's a, a socially accepted thing now, it appears, by the younger generation. However, according to what state, and Evan is going to post the, um, we have a little map here that names the state, tells what's legal, when it's legal, when it's not legal, um, how many ounces you're allowed to transport. For instance, I told you Alabama had just passed their law. They passed their medical legal use on May the 21st. It was signed by the governor. And it says for medical purposes only, the chart says transport ion, not clearly stated, uh, legal for licensed cultivators, not individual patients. So in other words, the people can sell it, but the user would have to have a card. Um, Atlanta, and that really surprised me, Georgia, let me tell you what they said. Do you have it handy? Uh, here it is, Georgia. 
Georgia says illegal, decriminalized in the cities of Atlanta, Clarkston, Forest Park, Savannah. It says medical purposes, CBD oil only. Less than five ounces of THC. And correct me if I'm wrong, if a THC is a drug that gets you high, is that correct? I believe that's what it is. Okay. I know you did research with me, so I was just trying to make sure. Uh, medical use only um, to cultivate is illegal. And the little chart that we will send out, there's a map she has on the screen now, but there's an, also a chart that we'll put on the on our web page. And it just tells you, like I say, the state, whether it's recreational, whether it's medical, whether there's a transport icon, whether it's for cultivators, and then it has different notes by it. But here in Birmingham, our mayor said that it was a, um, it wasn't a criminal offense, it's a misdemeanor. So Birmingham is trying to pass the possession as a misdemeanor. I know that I went to Connecticut and rented a car at the Hertz dealer. And when I got in the car, I had to step back out. Wow. It was, and you know, coming from Alabama, we, we weren't at all legal then. This was before the COVID. I got out, I drove back to the place. Mm -hmm. I told them, this car smells like marijuana. I don't want to be stopped and go to jail because you know I'm always scared of going to jail. So that's what I tried to do right. So the um, the lady told me, she says, well, this car had been in the neighboring state, Massachusetts. It's legal in Massachusetts and it's not legal in Connecticut yet, but Connecticut passed their law on June the 22nd, um, 2021. So, you know, you just have to be careful because where I come from in the South, if they pull you over and you're smoking, they're surely going to take you to jail. Maybe a nice cop would give you a warning, but for the most part, they were going to take you to jail. And so that's what a lot of states are fighting now, whether or not it is a misdemeanor or whether it's a criminal offense. But as far as HUD is concerned, it is a drug and it is a criminal offense. So now Ebony has Mississippi up on the um, screen. And for Mississippi, it is medical. Uh, let's see, on my chart that I have, if it says that Mississippi mass is legal. Mississippi decriminalized uh, first offense. So they'll give you a misdemeanor also. It is for medical CBD oil. The transportation is not clear and to cultivate is illegal. To grow your own in your own pot on your porch it is illegal. I know when I grew up, they had this Tom movie. <laughs> and those guys were growing it everywhere out of their cars, I think. Um, <laughs> some of you um, have experienced, I know, smelling marijuana at the service stations or wherever you stopped. But we've got to keep in mind that as far as HUD's concerned, it is illegal. Now, let me hear from some of you as to what you would do when you find it. What are some of the actions you take if you walked in, you were doing a unit inspection, and we have done this. Uh, Lisa, Julie, and I inspected the property in Mobile. And the marijuana was just spread it across the table. You could tell it wasn't the smoking tobacco that the resident complained about because it had the little seeds and everything. So what would you do if you walked in, you're doing a unit inspection and they had your resident had not cleaned up the I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. Talk to me, talk to me, talk to me. Vicki? Yes. What I would do is step out, call the police, because 
I'm not an expert on marijuana. So the only thing that would be the right thing to do is just tell, you know, just step out and don't say anything to the resident and just call the police and have the police come and identify if that's the substance. Okay. And then upon the police identifying it and the police must say, yes, this is marijuana. What's your next step? Uh, go back to my office and give them a notice, an eviction notice. Uh -oh. notice to eviction. <laughs> exactly. That sounds like following the rule. Anybody, yeah. else? Anybody else do anything differently? I think in a lot of cases we would do the same thing, but uh, generally the police won't do anything if it's just smell and odor. They really don't think that they have a defense or we have a case. And okay. so but we, yeah, we definitely give the residents a, a violation. Okay. Yeah. And if it happens again, you kind of have to use not the scare tactics, but I mean, they actually believe and know that it's not allowed. So uh, it, on the second offense, we'll give them eviction. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a good thing. And, and it might be great to get a copy of a police report so you have your documentation. Right. Okay. Nice. Uh, also, uh, and I think it's the lady who just spoke, uh, Ms. Mills, she says in Arizona, a lot of our residents work in the dispensaries and the office sometimes reek of the smell when residents or applicants come in and we were told there is nothing they can do about it. Hmm. That's, that's different. That's different, Linda. So they can smoke it in the dispensaries, I'm assuming. Or they no, just, they actually work. They're yeah, employees, yeah. People smoke around them in order for it to get in their clothes, I'm assuming. No, I, no just working around them. Oh, they, just, yeah. Mm -hmm. And it has an odor just working around. Right, right, right. See, that, that's something new on me. Right. Yeah, somebody could actually just open up a bag if you're around them. And I mean, it'll fill the room almost just like it's smoking in. Mm. Mm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Learn something new every day. So um, are there, is there anybody else online that has uh, lives in the state that has a dispensary? I know I went to Las Vegas and you know Planet Hollywood, right? Everybody knows Planet Hollywood. I saw a little sign, we were walking and having a good time, had kids. And I saw something that said Planet 13, no, Hollywood 13, Planet 13. That's what it was, it was Planet 13. I said, well, let's go in here. We went into Planet 13, they had a little restaurant. Guess what it was, guys? A dispensary. <laughs> Planet 13 in Hollywood is a, I mean, in Las Vegas is a dispensary. So don't go in there to eat because you'll be doing more than eating. And so I had to turn around and take the kids back out. And I thought, wow, you know, it, it, it was just different. It was different. They did have a restaurant too. And the restaurant was kind of outside of the dispensary area. But when the people came out with their bags and their goods, that's when I discovered they had a good taco, but we had to go. <laughs> Ms. Vicki, I'm curious, and I can't get my poll to work right now, but um, what people think HUD should do. Uh, any comments as far as should HUD do what the states are doing and be more lenient or... Any comments on if HUD should change its stance? I, mean, I mean, it's taking over. I mean, it's you can you can drive down the road and your car feels like it. I've been on the interstate and it feels up because somebody's passing by. Been in the Apple Store and uh, J.C. Penney's and it's everywhere. And like uh, you know, everyone was saying, it's almost like it's, it's acceptable. Everybody kind of tends to ignore it now, even the kids and your family and friends. And I don't know. If we join, it's just going to get worse. Um, it's socially acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, I think that I think that eventually, if we continue down this road, 
of acceptance that they will probably have to do something. Um, as more states come on board and as more states decriminalize it to misdemeanors, I'm thinking that they'll probably have to do something. Um, Ms. Vicki, we have a comment. Okay. Olivia says that I'm over a multifamily in Alabama and having a similar situation. The police have been called on multiple occasions and they say that because the smell is unable to be pinpointed, they can't do anything about it. I have gone in the unit and only smelled regular cigarette smoke. It's very frustrating because the resident complaining just thinks that I'm refusing to do anything about it, but that's just not the case. So that's two times that we've had that uh, today during our discussion. We have two managers who are faced with residents that don't believe that you're trying to do your job or you're trying to help them settle their situation because of the marijuana. Now, there again, I learned something today. I learned something from you guys today. I didn't know that the police could not do anything off of a smell. So I appreciate you all. That wasn't in my research. The stuff that I researched didn't say anything about um, the authorities not doing anything about smell. They had to have actual proof. Mm -hmm. And it makes you wonder about the residents though. Now I know back in the day they had all of these sprays and they burned this incense, mm -hmm. but you think it could be incense or a fragrance spray that they smell opposed to marijuana? Not this though. Okay. You, can't, you can't spray it off. That's why you smell people walking by all the time. You can't. Yeah. It's, it's hard to disguise it. But you know that there are a lot of advocates out there in the medical field that are, have proven that is helping the Alzheimer patients. Mm -hmm. uh, the, oh, NF, the NFL is considering it because it's gotten some of the players off of the opiates. Oh, uh, yeah, the, the pain medicine is people have started to use it and come off of the pills. And of course, they say you can't prove there's never a case where it's ever killed anybody, caused people to commit suicide or no, anything. no health. Yeah. Now, I did read that in the research, Mother. And, and you're, you're right. So that puts us back to what do you guys think that HUD might do? I won't say should do, that they might do. I was thinking, Linda, as you were talking, if they've authorized it for the athletes. That, that it's, it's negotiating, being negotiated. Okay. And it takes them off the opioids, then it might be a good thing, huh? Well, the couple that have done it have proven, because I mean, one, one athlete was saying that they the pills that the actual player, some of them take 10 to 12 a day, and they become really just at home and sleeping and tired and whatever. And one particular athlete, actually his wife convinced him. He was an advocate against drugs, but he tried it. And in six months, he was off the pills. And so they're, they're treating people with, was it PSP or whatever kind of thing. So there are stories about that and Alzheimer's. So. But it's different. It's like the farmers are farming. The products are different. It's not what our the people that the residents are smoking. Mm -hmm. The what the, the medical marijuana is is designed and treated and germinated to for a specific illness. Illness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not the stuff that our residents that that's different. They showed a university that's in Mississippi that the federal government has funded to grow and cultivate marijuana. Mm -hmm. um, and you're right, there, there are different strands. They're trying different strands. They're commingling the seeds and this, that, and the other. And um, they were saying that since it's being legalized, this professor was saying that since it's being legalized in so many states and there are cultivators in these states that 
the government is thinking about doing a partnership between this university in Mississippi, and I forgot the name of it, and some of these cultivators that are growing it to see if they can't come up with different cures and different things, especially pain, because that's what the doctor told me he was prescribing it for, pain, appetite uh, enhancer, and things of that nature. Well, that's really interesting. And so we're going to keep an eye out. But what I want you to walk away with from this session and this discussion, because I do want to tell you about two more things that are not necessarily about um, marijuana, is that when you're doing your inspections, as I think it was Linda said or someone said, and you come across it, she said she would step out, call the police, have the police to identify that way you have a police report before she would start eviction. Not just on the neighbor saying, I smell it. Or if you were like this resident that called in that they were about to evict. And we had to tell them that they could not evict her because they didn't really have any proof as to what it was. And you have hooker pipes and you have tobacco laying around. I, I think I would do, as the other young lady said, I think at that point, I would call the police and ask them to identify if this is tobacco or if this is marijuana. And based on that, would do uh, whatever was necessary, whether it was a lease violation or whether it was an eviction. But uh, we could not advise this resident, uh, I mean, this manager to evict this resident based on a pipe being there and what she thought might have been marijuana. And any of you who've been in my live classes know that I say that our residents can go down to legal aid and they can get an attorney and it costs them nothing. You've got to pay your attorney to represent you on frivolous lawsuits. So just be careful. Okay, so uh, I think that was great. Does anybody else want to say anything about marijuana? Anybody else have any suggestions about marijuana? You know, when I was doing my research yesterday and I called Ebony and I looked up just from my own curiosity in Birmingham, the hookah bars. So they have hookah salons, hookah studios, hookah bars. So. You know, it might have been that this resident really did have a refreshing type of tobacco. And this same type of tobacco might be what these other two residents are smelling. They know it's not normal cigarette smoke. I'm not saying that they don't identify or can't identify marijuana smoke. And like you said, I can identify when I'm at the service station and when that little boy passed me in the grocery store. So I'm not saying that they're wrong, but I'm saying that we do need evidence. We do need evidence. And I think whomever it was that said to have the police to come in and let them identify. Any other comments about the marijuana? No. In larger cities, you'd be lucky to even get a police to answer the call. Wow. Yeah. yeah. If they do, it'll probably be four hours later. Yeah. I, I mean, and, and, and that's something, too. I don't know whether everybody is having that or not, but a manager told me the other day that she was trying to have a uh, young lady trespass who came on her property to visit her grandmother. Her um, son got to fighting with some more kids on the playground. He went outside to play. And, you know, kids can be mean. They bullied him, she said. She went to her car, got her gun, and went to the playground. So, of course, she had to, to go. The grandmother is 69. She got rolled up. They're asking for evictions. And um, she said she called the police trying to keep the young lady there and talk to her. And it took the police four hours and the girl left. So I understand, Mother. Sometimes, you know, they take their time. The other things I wanted to talk about was before we have our next Tuesday tip, it will be the ending of the CDC moratorium. 
Don't you guys forget that it's ending. We talked about this before. We talked about the fact that um, we might be receiving some residents that are being evicted or put out. Uh, I was on a seminar with Hood, a webinar with Hood, and they were saying that um, perhaps if you could work out payment agreements with them, that it would keep you from having a vacancy. That's always a thought. We had talked about that in a previous discussion. And they were talking about managers thinking that the process with the emergency funds is so long that there's some companies uh, who are setting up lawyers at the courthouse that the residents can go and talk to from there because the process is taking too long. And that if the owners or management agencies were to go with their resident into this empty room at the courthouse where they had this set up, that it would save some time. So I thought that was interesting. But as of the 31st of July, the moratorium will be gone. The next thing that we will talk about also, uh, you know, we're ending up the series on MORs. So the next three sessions before our live session will be on MORs. But you know, we have a variant out there, guys. We talked about this before also. So my suggestions to you would be if you found yourself lacking something under the COVID-19 in terms of a policy or a procedure for signatures or giving your ARs or your IRs to the resident, please, please get on top of it now while we have this little bitty window. My prediction, because you know I've got this crystal ball, my prediction is that by the end of September, we're going to be on lockdown. Now, does that mean everything's going to close down like it did before? I don't believe they're going to close the economy down the way they did before. But I do believe they're going to mandate mask wearing. They're going to ask you to keep your six foot distance. Um, and as KI, our governor here in Alabama, who went viral for her speech says, use some good common sense. So, you know, sometimes people don't use good common sense. And in those cases, you're gonna have to have policies and procedures for your property. Like during the last COVID, one lady said she doesn't like wearing masks and she doesn't think that she has to. She doesn't like this, she doesn't like that. You have a whole community of people that you're responsible for. So what one person doesn't like might be the death of another person. So I urge you to look at your policies and procedures and decide, you know, what will you do? How will you handle it? I'm doing a little more research on it. I know that uh, here in Alabama, and I'm sure Alabama makes the news for some of everything. You've seen the directors from our local hospital, UAB, and they have talked about how it has risen. I have a girlfriend who's over the emergency room, and she called me last night. She said, Vicki, you've got to be careful because she knows that I have a sick child at home. And she said, girl, today in the emergency room, it was just terrible. Now, you want to go around and ask people, have you been vaccinated? But that is a personal thing. And everybody doesn't want to share. Those people who are proud of being vaccinated, you don't even have to ask them. They tell you, I had my shot. I had my shot. But they're talking about the social media putting out wrong information. But yet the people who have been vaccinated a lot of them have wrong information also. When they gave the vaccination, and I did get one, I asked, what will this do? They told me, 
if you catch the virus, this will keep you hopefully from going on a ventilator or being too sick. They did not say that this vaccination right. is a cure right. for COVID. Right. That's what a lot of people think. So help your residents be knowledgeable, especially if you have high rises. Because if you don't have high rises, the neighbors don't move to visit or, or trot in the same area. But help your uh, residents realize the purpose for the vaccination and the reason why you should be vaccinated. I'm going to tell you this one last story and then we'll close out. She said they had a mother-daughter incident at the hospital through the emergency room. They both went on the ventilator. The daughter, who was 32, did not make it. The mother who's 60 is still on the ventilator, but it's looking promising. I believe in the vaccine. I believe in masks. I want you all not to betray your beliefs on your residents but give them enough information that they can make a good decision. It's almost like bed bugs. You know, if, and, and I'm serious, that's the way I look at it. We didn't educate our residents about bed bugs until we started having infestation that it was so hard for us to get rid of. So uh, if you have newsletters, put it in newsletters. If you don't, do a little research or, or, or take something out of the paper or CNN or Fox News or whatever you watch. You put it up on the bulletin board. Help them become knowledgeable about this. Because like I say, I don't think they're going to lock us down as tight as they did before. But I do think that in a lot of cases that some employers are going to require and mandate the vaccine and the vaccination. And in my research on it, which I won't be ready to discuss with you until our next live session, but so far I have found that insurance companies are saying that they won't insure or they won't pay if the patient has not been vaccinated. Because a typical bill, since I've been talking to my friends and what have you that are physicians, a typical bill for taking care of a COVID patient can get as high as in the millions. So as good stewards of HUD's money, uh, as good stewards of the economy that we live in, uh, I think we should educate our residents. Questions, comments? I put a link in there for the CDC communication toolkits that they can use. Um, they have them specifically for various types of businesses and settings. So you might be able to find even just a poster or something that you can put up somewhere on property. And also just want to mention going back to the eviction moratorium ending, I also shared a link that you can share with your residents um, for all 50 states where if they need help, those are the resources that they can look up. Okay. Um, the residents that might come to apply with you because they have been evicted. I don't know whether you all have been keeping up with it on the news, but they were saying that uh, affordable housing is the issue to find affordable apartments. Now they weren't necessarily talking about affordable on our end with section eight, but I believe in everything that I've been reading on the multifamily insider and all of that, that our project-based units will get a surge. We will get some of this because people have nowhere else to go. And you might want to consider what your tenant selection plan says 
and your criteria, your credit criteria, as far as, you know, some, some uh, tenant selection plans I've seen, and they have the credit criteria has to be this, no eviction, this, that, and the other. And if they're evicted from a HUD project-based unit, then they've got to wait anyway. So consider those things and um, let's keep our ears and eyes open. If you guys get anything in your states or in your locations that you think might be critical uh, or helpful to other managers, please send it to me so we can get it out there. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Anybody else? Um, no, I don't see any more comments. Okay. Um, we've got everybody registered. Ebony, I'm sure you've got the 19 people. Uh, can you get the 19 people we have on here and make sure that we have, I have a surprise for them. And um, I think that's all I have though, guys. Y'all won't talk to me. I have to get me some talkers. Y'all won't talk to me. If you need, um, it's always good to have a copy of the HUD rule on marijuana for your residents that come in and say, I have a medical card. It takes me back to one of Tyler Perry's plays where uh, this character in this place named Bam, Bam has a medical card. Both of them are recreational use, but she has a medical card. And she says, Bam, I got a card. You know, so if you have somebody that wants to flash their card on you, uh, you could also flash this notice on them. That's good. I'm glad you got a card, but you can't use it here. And uh, let that be that. And we will post those other things out there for you about the states and what states are doing. We appreciate you guys being here. I'm going to ask you one more time. Does anybody have anything they want to say? Violence takes the room. <laughs> have a great time. We'll see you. See you again soon. Have a great day. Thank you. I'm going to tell y'all the truth. I'm going to get another three, four calls in this week. It always happens, but y'all can call me. Y'all can email me. I know you're shy. <laughs> have a great one. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.